and I'm yourself. In a time when black Americans, especially the younger generation, are facing challenges all across this country, in varying forms of ongoing physical violence, economic exploitation, race-conscious amnesia, political powerlessness, cultural confusion, moral and spiritual disorientation and disassociation, our people are wondering and floundering looking for the next Martin Luther King Jr. or Malcolm X to provide the bold and charismatic leadership to address the frustrations and community apathy that impact us today. Many black and white Americans thought that the election of President Barack Obama was a sign that America was fully integrated and accepting of all black Americans. The reality, however, exposed the same violent, racist underbelly our people experienced during slavery and even after the emancipation of the so-called American Negro. As a whole, black Americans today are more disenfranchised, disillusioned, terrorized, and exploited than ever before. In light of this current reality, we must ask if our black leaders are doing the job needed today for black Americans. Have our black leaders been deceived, manipulated, or bought into advocating for the needs of all minorities and failed to advocate for the uniquely historic needs of black Americans? Is there still a need for a single black national leader to rally black people around the fear and frustration that affect us daily? Do we need our national and local black leadership working together to boldly build a black American nation within the American society? The film you're about to watch posed these and other questions about black leadership to the black public of Spartanburg, South Carolina. You will hear from a representative cross-section of members of that community, uh, black educators, activists, high school and college students, professionals, ministers, entrepreneurs, industrial workers, the formerly incarcerated and persons who are homeless. And as you listen, we invite you to weigh in on or discuss the sentiments voiced by this black community and decide for yourself what we need to do as a nation of people to tackle the needs, concerns, and interests of our community and improve the conditions of our people. This is in remembrance of our ancestors Sam Cooke and Marvin Gaye Donnie Hathaway And all that came before You opened up a door race transforms itself into a nation through its leaders and through its common people. A nation rises on its own wings or is held down by its own weight. True leaders are never apart from the people. Their only business in front of others is to inspire and challenge the people to work hard, be noble, and come on up. It's our responsibility to improve the conditions. We can't lobby for someone else to improve it for us. But once we step it up, and as a people, things will change. And if we don't, they won't. You know, we can march, we can hoop and holler, we can riot, but at the end of the day, it's our responsibility. And since we have a common sense of purpose, we have no common leadership and I just think that we need to open our eyes 
and not allow um, the majority race to continue to be in power and force to in power, we still lose out because while the next majority race is people of color, they don't see themselves being identified with the same history, culture, and problems, and goals that black people have. So we find ourselves still without a leadership. And at this point in time, we as black people need to concentrate on black people, African Americans, I want to say. You know, I think we need to concentrate on each other, help build our communities up, you know, uh, focus on ourselves, you know, and once we are able to unify ourselves and strengthen our communities, you know, then I believe that we can help others. What do members of the black community think about national black leadership? My general impression of black leadership uh, on a national level is we have certain persons who continue to champion the calls of, uh, of black folk. Mm -hmm. um, we have come a long way, I believe, uh, as a people. We've made some ground in certain areas, but we still have so far to go. And leaders can only be as strong as the people that they lead. And we have a dysfunctional group of people. We have to be African Americans who uh, have great opportunities for education but still undereducated. We have great opportunities for economic empowerment but are still poor. We have great opportunities for um, creating in their communities um, institutions. Um, we have a greatest number of educated blacks we've ever had as far as being degreed, but our historical black colleges and universities are dying. Uh, we don't give back. So our leaders can't be any stronger than the people they lead. But it's not the people who rise to the top responsibility to the lead. It's the responsibility of people who are being impacted by the legislation and by what happens in Congress and by what happens in the corporate world to take a stand, and we don't do it. And so why should they worry about leading a group of people who make no demands on our society? You know, there are not a ton of black leaders, and there are not a ton of people looking out for the interests of black people. They all, most of our issues actually coincide with everyone else's issues, but we just don't stand out and say, hi, we have that same problem too. We want access to health care. We want access to housing. We need jobs. And we actually need those things more, mm -hmm. you know, because we don't have those things. We're, we're, a lot of us are living in poverty, so we do have to stand up and we do have to say our issues are important to us. Mm -hmm. And when there is a you know, there's a little bit more equality, then I think that we can step out and say, okay, now let's look at everyone as a whole, but someone has to stand up for us. Uh, we're fragmented in our thinking, and we don't come together and realize we all have something great to bring to the table. We don't have a, have a complete agenda, in my opinion. We have a few things locally, but I don't see the type of unity that I would like to see in terms of in terms of black leadership. I used to be very critical of some of our people who rose to the forefront who happened to be African Americans in national positions. And then when I compared them to what their white counterparts did in those same positions, I realized that it's the system that is confining, not defining. And I don't know if we could hold African Americans to any greater standard than their white counterparts, because I think it's the heart of the person that leads what they do in those positions. And so I guess I've mellowed a lot, or either I've been disappointed so much until my expectations are not what they used to be. And we've got to get over this disease of complacency and just settling in. I'm just glad to be here, you know. <laughs> what is black leadership? Well, a leader is one who's not afraid to um, support an issue if needed and speak up for an issue 
or get a group together, take a risk, and try to solve a problem. I think that a black leader is someone who is there to serve um, black people and non-black people. But at the same time, this black leader takes into special account that black people in America and other parts of the world have been marginalized for a long time. So because of that special history, that black leader makes sure that he or she um, represents the issues or advocates for the issues that um, black people are currently facing right now because of the history of racism. The way that I would like to say it is being a revolutionary presence in complacency. I think a black leader is that. I think, uh, and revolutionary is not bad. I, I think of that term and I think change, I think progress, I think uh, innovation. And so to me, that would be what a black leader represents for the community in general. Mm -hmm. A leader that happens to be black is someone that is in a position and a role uh, that shows up in suits and ties, that uh, is in board meetings, um, that is well known by the community, but not well known for changing much. Mm -hmm. You just happen to be black and you're in a nice role. Mm -hmm. And I strive to not be that person. A leader that happens to be black is a person that uh, goes across the board and tries to uh, make friends, tries to pacify everyone. Uh, they will try to speak for a group of people without ever really asking them uh, their opinion. Um, you know, it, it, and usually a person, a leader that uh, just happens to be black, it's, it's gonna, money's gonna play some kind of role. Uh, a black leader um, has a voice and, and they're not motivated by money. Of course, we all need you know, a certain level of money to be able to survive. That's what society tells us, but um, they, their voice is more important than, um, than, than their paycheck, and, they, and they're willing to sacrifice uh, their paycheck to be able to say, I'm, I'm going to stand for what's right. I don't get a lot caught up in terms of what you would classify as being black leadership, because I think what has happened is that every person has an opportunity to be a leader within themselves and to look at it not within the context of having a black leader, but in the context of having someone as a leader who has affinity for the issues that affect you. And having a black face doesn't always necessarily mean black leadership doesn't necessarily be positive change for black people. Black professionals, politicians, community activists, and prominent people, are they all leaders in the black community? Becoming a leader, I believe, is a process. And, and just so happen, happening to be a black person that's operating in that role, I think that kind of, that to me is probably a much more comfortable way of even identifying leadership as opposed to there just being black leaders. Because you have a lot of people that are black leaders that aren't doing anything, you know, and or they're accomplishing what their personal uh, resume uh, needs <laughs> in order to sustain their lifestyle. But they're really not doing anything that impacts our people on a whole and they're just holding a position. Um, and I say that uh, in all honesty because I've been a black professional <laughs> and I've, I've worked with black leaders or what we call black leaders. And, you know, you can be a black professional and I'm, I'm not a hypocrite, you know. When I was working in corporate America, I was just so happened to be the only black person in the management role with some of the companies that I worked for. And I was considered a, a professional and I was black, you know. Um, I think that me being a black professional had no impact on society or or my community. Uh, I thought I had a good job, I made a good salary, and uh, I was able to afford to live decently uh, at that time. But I never had any type of connection, I felt like, with people in my community. I was so busy trying to pay my bills that, you know, <laughs> that's all I was accomplishing was I was trying to pay bills and that was it you know um, I think that when you take on the role and responsibility of being a black leader uh, it is so much more in depth 
and it's so much more involved. It's not just you're doing a job, you look nice on paper, or you, you have a position of authority, but you know, what exactly are you doing with that position of authority? How are you impacting everybody around you? You know, and I didn't feel that I did what I could in those situations, don't get me wrong, but I was limited by my job description, you know, and I didn't have any power because I was working for somebody else. So yeah, I was a black professional and, you know, in the industry considered a leader in that industry, but I wasn't impacting anybody. I couldn't change the rules. I couldn't fix anything. Cause there were a ton of people I would have loved to help, but I didn't have the I didn't have the ability or the tools to help those folks, you know. So it is a difference to me. It's a big difference. They're limited because the work that they do really just serves the corporate empires, be they the medical, you know, professions or uh, technological ones. Now there are ways that those with these abilities can contribute to us if they would. However, most are employed in occupation that solely serve the purpose of the powers that be. Well, a politician is someone who makes public help make public policy and it's for the benefit of all. So, but an activist is someone who will step out and speak up and work for a cause. <laughs> and a black leader is one who kind of get people together and try to solve problems that are affecting all. We talk about leadership. I think we have to make a distinction between those people who are elected versus those people who are doing things to change the condition of people period. Uh, for example, someone may be elected to a government office, but that doesn't necessarily make them a black leader. That's, that's a uh, position. When they run for and they, uh, their objective is different than trying to meet needs of a certain group of people. Mm -hmm. And so what happens, right, if they have a type of particular type of leadership, um, it more or less uh, becomes sort of compromised where you're not, you get something, but you know, you, it's not always on the focus of the black community. And I think there are some people, right, in particular organizers at the grassroots level who focus specifically on black people and their conditions, and that's where the more of the work get done. And those people will uh, put um, pressure on those people that are elected to change the condition of the community as a whole. And I think that's where the real leadership come in, and those people in the community, those people doing the groundwork, are those ones that put pressure on political leaders to uh, bring about change. If you go back and look at the 50s, 60s or whatever, the people that uh, brought about the change were not the ones that were elected. Uh, those were the ones that went out in the community and gathered people together and, and identified the issues. And I think that's one of the things the leadership do, right, is go and talk to the people, find out what the issues are, and try to uh, make those issues relevant and bring them to the forefront. Then there are those people who are grassroots, uh, community activists or organizers, or people who simply see an issue that needs to be addressed and uh, they spend time and energy uh, dealing with that. And of course, there are also people who are leaders who don't necessarily see themselves as leading anybody, but they provide leadership through the service that they, uh, that they get from people. Um, and people look up to them and admire them uh, as though they are leaders, although they don't have any official capacity as leaders. I, I think that there's a level of, of politics across the board. Um, and then I also think that black leaders black activists are, are a lot of the same. I think there's a lot of similarities between the three. I think with black politicians there tends to be um, they're a little bit more governed by a, uh, a certain way of thinking that might not be as large as the actual issue at hand. Um, it's going to be a smaller scale I think. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to 
you're, you're black activists. I think those are the people that you see that are doing the work, um, but they're connected to the leaders in the community because we need to all be connected. So I think there's a lot of, and, and the same for the politician, I think there's a lot of uh, interconnectedness, but I'm not sure that they're all doing the same thing. And I don't think that they're supposed to. I think they're supposed to be interconnected, all working together. Um, and I think we sometimes have a disconnect there. I think, I think it'd be an awesome thing to, to see that be connected the way that it should be. But right now, I think there's a lot of um, individual goals for the black leader, for the black politician, for the black activist, and maybe not all on the same page. Yeah. Well, now, if you're a leader, you don't have to have wealth to be um, considered a leader or take a leadership role. Mm -hmm. um, it's just like this interview. I'm not prominent. That's not what my mission is in life. My mission is to help others. And the question that you proposed to me as far as prominent wealth comes to mind, but that doesn't mean that they have the ability to lead. Whereas leadership is something you're naturally instinctively born with or sometimes cast into a role, such as my role, um, education and awareness toward blindness. And that's because of what I went through as a child, watching my father lose his eyesight at the age of 34. Um, because we have a lot of money, doesn't necessarily make, make you a leader. I think being prominent, I looked at more of having the respect of your peers, respect of the community. Uh, typically, if you're a prominent uh, individual, I think that puts you more in the limelight as being a, a black leader, whether you want to or not. Uh, I think being a black professional, I think it's good that people get to see. I, you know, I remember growing up, um, it was a big deal to me to see a black doctor. Uh, it was a big deal to me to have a black teacher. It was a big deal to me to see a, a black lawyer. So I think, you know, in that aspect, yes. But it, as far as being a leader, it has to be in you. It, it, it can't be your job or something like that. I could be, you know, the mayor or the governor, and, and I'm just as black as anyone else. That doesn't mean I'm a black leader. It doesn't mean I'm even a good leader. This means that's my job. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the individual. But I think it is a level of importance to have those two positions. I tend to admire those people who are grassroots uh, leaders in the sense that they see a problem that needs to be addressed and they utilize their skills and energies to either organize or to try to come up with solutions themselves or find others who can help bring solutions. Um, whereas people who are elected to positions, then they have a responsibility of fulfilling whatever um, uh, whatever requirements there are for the positions that they hold. And that's also for people who are appointed, uh, whether they are in um, a fraternal organization or a civic organization, then they are, the organization that they are a part of sets the tone for the kind of leadership that they provide and the kind of services that they provide. But again, overall, I tend to admire and look up to those people who are grassroots leaders and who have not been appointed or elected to that position. The leadership that I respect is that of those people that see through the facade and sees through what is being presented as opposed to the truth, the hypocrisy of what they are about, and of the, those that have traditionally controlled things and imposed their will upon us, which has been solely for the purpose of subjugating and exploiting us and continues to be today. The leaders that I respect are those that, uh, that, are, that are willing to assert those things that would benefit us as a people. Let's examine small town Spartanburg, South Carolina as a case study of black leadership.
think we have um, several black leaders here in Spartanburg. I think, I think that it's a similar issue, a connection issue. I know I've said that before, but when, when I think about black leadership here, I think that it turns into the bigger, uh, bigger organizations that are here that have black leadership kind of sprinkled in there, but there's nothing that's uh, dynamic, revolutionary, different, um, progressive. And so those are the things that concern me. But I think there's definitely room to grow. Um, I think there's room for uh, us to accept that this is where we are, where are we going, so that we can actually see you know, something more than just trying to build up maybe a north side oh, we want to build up this community, that's my black leadership for the day, when really the entire community has its issues, it's not just a north side. And so those things concern me. So I think, I think that that's an issue in black leadership right now in Spartanburg. Yeah. I'll also sometimes question the leaders that are there. And what I mean by this is sometimes they are appointed by people that did not come from our community. We need to start grooming people of our liking, that have our interest, and push these people up there. Many times people from outside the community will come in and they will find the person that appears out of nowhere and that becomes a designated leader for the, for the group. And in m many cases that is not the case. So I think there is a lot of leaders in the background that need to step forward and we need to push those people. That's on national and all national issues start as grassroots things. They start in our own neighborhood. They start in our own homes. And this is where it has to come from. But it needs to be from us, not from someone else that basically appoints and anoints somebody from their perspective because they can get an easy interview or whatever takes place. I believe that anytime you take on the position of being a leader in the community, I believe that you have to have a vested interest in that community and a vested vision that helps everyone in that community. So I don't think that you should be a black leader in a black community that you're not a part of. Um, I have a problem with people who work uh, on a community but they live in the suburbs you know and you're doing community leadership or community activism but you live in a, a white neighborhood you know how are you building your community what are you adding to the community because you don't live there you, you're just somebody on the outside looking in you're no different than other people who are looking in that community so you're not helping so it's important to me that if you are going to be a community leader or a community organizer or whatever to be a part of that community not just because of the color of your skin but because of the outcome or the intent of the reason that you're there if you're going to help black children black youth or black people as a whole then where are you inside of that community you have to be amongst that community in order to lead that community that's just my personal opinion so go to any of these communities and ask them who's a black leader I guarantee you their answer will be very different than the people that uh, you see on television or in the newspapers all the time. Um, so I think the role is to have a voice and be visible. People should be able to see you. They should see you in the same places where they go. Uh, if not, how can you ever have a pulse on, on what's going on in that area? I think the major thing about Spartanburg communities is that we don't have a sense of community. We don't have black leadership that communicates and have private conversations among themselves. Um, we have a great number of sororities, fraternities that have their agenda. We have the religious community that has its agenda. We have a few political leaders that have their agenda. We have a few corporate leaders who have their agenda. I don't know if we have any one body that brings them together where they can synthesize and understand and have an overlay of how all of this interacts and how they and how we um, 
can forge um, a discussion and keep a mechanism in place so that we all can understand and see developments in all of these areas and how they impact one another. I think we, as a race of people, I still have become separate and divided with high and lofty goals, but don't see how we can all work together to achieve them using the very facets of the community to do it. Yeah. We, we're blindsided because we keep ourselves with blinders on. That's a, that's a problem. Let's meet a few of Spartanburg's contemporary black leaders. Ms. Aston is known for transportation. People don't even know how he sent buses out uh, to Katrina, uh, how he sent up to Washington, D.C., the one men march. Um, Mr. Edson does things on a national scale. Um, he was instrumental in the BMW when they, when they came in. And that's where the prominent come in. And see us, little people, or people that don't pay attention or keep their eyes on People that, like a Charles Atchison, they don't see the significance that the big picture brings down and trickle down to people like myself. Being around and, and following Mr. Talley, uh, it's done a lot of wonderful things here in the city of Spartanburg. Then when I got on uh, city council, um, he was still there and the work he done by orchestrating, bringing the Carolina Panthers to the city of Spottenburg. Uh, you have your QS1, you have your Marriott, uh, the redesigning of the Morgan Square. All of that came up under his leadership. But the most wonderful thing I love about that is that I had a platform, and the platform was to kind of revitalize the South Side. And we talked about a grocery store because that area was underserved. And so he the one signed and promoted $7 million to that site. And we got a group of people together. He gave me several names that he thought should be on the Southside Redevelopment Board. And so he was very, very helpful uh, in that process. So, you know, that was a person that I admired in the way that he had charisma working with people. He could work with anybody and there would be no conflicts or, or anything like that. Um, Mary Thomas with the Spumberg County Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she oversees a lot of fun and, and that foundation is set up to give back to the community. Um, so having someone who, who is involved and knows the ins and outs of fundraising and, and um, stock options and investing, it's just that I just think that's, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, our superintendent of District 7, Dr. Booker, um, uh, the uh, president CEO of, of Regenesis, and those others in our community, um, whether it's Hope Blackley with our clerk of court, our uh, Liberty with Butterfly. You have these professionals in our community who I see as both leader and mentor. Um, not only are they out front, not, all, not only are they influential in our community, but there are persons who are shaping their lives uh, after the model in which, in which they, they present. So absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. Mr. John C. Abercrombie. Uh, I've been very fortunate to work with Mr. Abercrombie. He grew up during a time where, you know, there was a whites only fountain still. And he, he's a chemist, you know, by trade. He went to college and that was expected, you know. Uh, it's so wonderful getting to know him and learning things from him because his perspective, I feel like he's aware of all those negative things, but those things haven't impacted him and stopped him from his agenda, which I appreciate because it's taught me a lot, you know. And, and he's, you know, he's members of organizations and things like that. He's very active in his church, and you know, he. I, I, I don't want to tell his age because he probably killed me, but uh, he's still he's he's ready to take on other roles of leadership, even though he doesn't consider it being a leader. He just wants to get his message out and he wants to impact this community based on the things that he feels 
are necessary to, to deal with, you know, and he's been fortunate enough to have some experience in different, you know, positions and jobs that he's done um, to where he's just saying, you know what, I'm tired and people need to wake up and I'm, I'm woke. So I'm going to help wake as many people up as I possibly can. <laughs> and I appreciate that because, you know, you, you, you can find yourself becoming bitter um, when you are a black professional and that's all you know. You know, oh, I went to college. I did this and I did that and I had this good job. But then you lose that job. And then who are you at that point? How is your life defined? Because he lost his job. And he he lost his job, had gotten a death sentence of uh, he was going to die in like a small period of time. All these things happened to him kind of all at once. And to me, anybody that can, you know, outlive the outlive all the things that are against you. You know, he wasn't supposed to go to college. And then going to college, he wasn't supposed to graduate. Then after graduating, he wasn't supposed to be a chemist. He wasn't supposed to have a good job. He wasn't supposed to do well and raise a family and stay married. You know, those are things that our people aren't supposed to do because we're supposed to be out, you know, hanging out on the blocks, wearing our pants, you know, or being baby mamas and baby daddies. You know, that's not what our culture is. And he has survived all of these stereotypes and he's still now in a place where it's fresh to him he's ready to take on things that you know people who would never touch in his position they wouldn't touch it they were like well you know they're just leave them alone you've lived your life you've done this and that and just don't get involved and, and that's not what he's doing so I really admire that about him and I'm appreciative to know him because it's, it's helping me even get myself together you know and, and figure out what it is exactly that I want to do so one of the first words to come to mind would be Brenda Lee. Um, haven't had a lot of personal contact with her, but just her courage and boldness, you know, to, to speak her conviction uh, about controversy, you know, is, is important to me. And I know that she's paid a price uh, in order to do that. Um, I think that uh, Fisher, the uh, police chief, did a great service to our community during his time in service, uh, bringing the black community and the police force uh, together, uh, you know, and, and uh, raising the confidence of the black community in, in the police force. And I think just as a representative of, of uh, law, uh, being a black male, you know, in a, in a society where so often black males are presented as being uh, unlawful, I think that uh, that was good. He was a he was an upright guy. He was a guy that lived beyond uh, seemingly above uh, reproach, personal reproach, and, uh, and I'm sure that he was he was vetted. So. One man who really stands out to me is Judge Supreme Court Justice Don Beatty, and he's right here local in Spartanburg. I look to him a whole lot just because one, I look to go into law and legal profession, and he's really made some firm standpoints and advocate strongly for African Americans both um, at a local and state level. Well I have a historical figure that I do admire the most and her name is Kay Water. She is someone who I admire greatly. Uh, we, we meet often and talk and she is just a, a, a wonderful professional um, Someone who I uh, rely on to and trust to tell me the truth about things and who I can go and talk to and, and know that uh, that I'm going to get some great feedback uh, no matter whether it's positive or negative and it's, and it's well received. Uh, you know, I met Tyrone Gilmore, you know, Superintendent Tyrone Gilmore at the point in time. I said, that was utterly fantastic uh, person at that point in time of, you know, being, he was the uh, grand basilisk of Omega Sci-Fi and also the superintendent of the education here. And I'm going like, man, Spartanburg got it going on. It's like all of these folks are in great position of leadership, responsibility, and uh, to, to carry on. So it was several folks that I met here in Spartanburg that I said, man, this is a great community. Mm -hmm. yeah, Mr. Kitty Tellis. Uh, Ms. Teller's father uh, was a business owner here uh, in the community, a very successful business owner. And very quietly, um, during segregation, he provided the bus for the football players to go back and forth to South Carolina to the various football games. And uh, she always impressed me as a, um, she said what she felt, whatever, whatever was on her mind, she said that. Um, 
She's very committed to her family and to her business. Um, she was one of the ones that women uh, that I admired. And I uh, Harold Mitchell, and while he's known as a state legislator, uh, that's not why I'm mentioning him. Uh, when I moved back to Spartanburg uh, in 1988, eventually I, I, I heard about him and his work as a grassroots activist concerned about uh, uh, environmental um, contamination. Today that would be called environmental racism if that contamination occurs in a, <clears throat> a minority, a minority uh, ethnic minority community. So the work, the work that Harold Mitchell did, uh, bringing to light uh, and, uh, and addressing the problem of the uh, contamination in the Arkwright community. Is that not only did his uh, did his efforts uh, result in a cleanup program, but it also resulted in a new community uh, institution called Regenesis, which initially provided healthcare services to underserved uh, members of our community. So that alone, uh, I think. Just that, that particular matter alone, the, the cleanup and the formation of his genesis uh, is enough uh, for him to earn my respect because um, it took a tremendous amount of, of effort and um, a commitment to take that project from uh, its very beginnings to the point where some useless services were being rendered to a larger population, not just to the people who were uh, immediately affected by the, uh, the toxic waste uh, that was there. And obviously, at the time, he was not seeking leadership position, even though ultimately he was elected to the state legislature. Uh, but he got involved initially not because of the desire to be a leader, but because he wanted to see some action uh, taking about something that was uh, harming people. In the Dr. Arjun Grant, not being a, uh, not growing up in Spartanburg, but I think the way she uh, became a part of this community, she. Uh, uh, immersed herself in becoming familiar with the community in which she was brought here because of her position as assistant superintendent for District 7. And after that, uh, of course, she went into the ministry, but it's her heart. Her heart is caring for mankind. And that is um, what draws me for her name, is that she is a giver and not necessarily a taker. She gives. And that is important. James Cheek. I say that because he continues, even though he's been battered and bruised, he continues to stay on the field to play. That people receive justice. They may not get their equal rights, but he's out there on that field and he's working so that people's, people's rights or upheld. Um, I see him tirelessly giving in many arenas and it's not for recognition for himself. It is because he is aware of the judicial system. He was able to go and learn and he has given back on a continuous basis. So I truly respect him for that. What will happen if the black community lacks the kind of bold and revolutionary leadership it needs today? If we don't have the right leadership for the black community, then a lot of things are, you know, going to um, fall by the wayside. We know our cause more than anybody else. 
and unless we fight for that cause, it's going to quietly go away without any, or be taken away. Yes, it's important to advocate for all men's rights and all women's rights, but also just like you, like I said, you can never forget where you're from. So there needs to be a special interest, I feel, towards your black people, whether that's um, make sure there's an inclusion or whether that's maybe the extra 10% that you have to put out there to make sure that it's reaching um, the 80%. Uh, I know we have some new young leaders, like we have Erica Brown, we have Michael Brown, that is a councilman. So they're, they're both kind of quiet, but I think that maybe we need to work on being more bold and standing out a little bit more. And basically, even for myself, rising up as a leader and being more vocal, because it's very easy to step back and get involved in your own life, in your own business, and not worry about other things that's going on. But I guess it's not really fair to the people around us mm -hmm. that really need some help. And as a leader, you know, we need to do a better job with that. Okay. So many instances, they have become not as as they might have. Much of it is rhetoric and very little doing. Very little force being applied or to implement certain things. In fact, uh, many of them have pretty much been coming under the control of the uh, corporate people that fund them, I mean, you know, um, it's a totally different thing from what it, what it once was. It's like, it's like uh, inspired leaders, they uh, go on the track where in the beginning of the process they inspire to do right and they do right for the community, but then, you know, you got the ones that's when they get in that certain level of the place that they wanted to be, they kind of shred away from the main goal that where they first started off at. What happens locally, I think, with a lot of things, you start out, you start out one way, and you, you're all gung ho about it. And I think once you get inside and, and you start realizing, if I keep making these people upset, I'm not going to advance my career. If I don't advance my career, um, I don't make six figures. You know, uh, if I don't make six figures, I can't have everything that I want. I can't. Um, you know, have the big house on the hill. I can't have the four or five cars. I can't have the, uh, the beautiful wife. I can't have the beautiful husband, for that matter, because we just said black leaders. Um, so it's, it's very, um, I think that that's what happens with that. I think a lot of times people have the right mentality, but as you kind of get older and, and uh, lose some of the fight out of you, or you start seeing like, hey, this is gonna cost you know, me a lot of money if I keep agitating. It's just a lot easier to be quiet. Sometimes we get in a leadership role as a black person and we forget where we came from. Uh, we think we are better than the other blacks. Uh, we are selfish. Uh, jealous of each other. Don't want to help. Uh, we might have an attitude, I got mine, you can get yours. Some of us think we have arrived, you know. I think that we've lost that cohesiveness that we had, and I think we need to get back to that place, um, you know, where, where we realize that, that, you know, we have some issues in our community that, that need to be addressed. A truly heartbreaking thing for me is that it seems that inclusion in the middle class uh, so often means that we are insulated from the middle and low class and we can't, uh, we can't empathize. Uh, we don't want to risk our achievement to have a divorce, you know, for them. So I think it's extremely important. If we don't voice it, it won't be voiced. I've sat at tables where, as I began to speak about issues confronting black boys and the challenges they have and the things that need to be done in order to assure their inclusion, I've been louded out. I've been accused of racially profiling because the people did not want to actually deal with those things. They rather, uh, let's blame the boys for their plight.
Mm -hmm. Let's blame the parents. Let's just say it's the economic condition. Well, something creates the economic condition. Uh, we don't want to include them when we talk about dropouts. So many of our kids don't even get in the dropout numbers, so our dropout numbers are very low because we don't talk about the kids who are not counted because they didn't make it to the ninth grade. Right. And so it's not a honest presentation of what's happening in our school system. My thing is we can't, we can't exclude any child. And so our dropout rate is not 7% or 10%. Our dropout rate is 40% or 50% when we look at the kids that are excluded. And I know things are being done, but I think that if a person's in a position to be a policymaker or to influence policy, and he fails to do it because he's insecure in his own position and more concerned about his personal success than, than those he represent, I think that it's an atrocity. Mm -hmm. I think we're past the point of uh, speaking for too many races at one point. I think it has to be about us. You know, and, and that's the difference between a black leader and a leader who just happens to be black. I, I just find it very interesting uh, at this point, fast forward to this point in my life with the experience I have politically, um, that a lot of elected officials, I don't think, understand politics. Because what happens is once you get elected and all of a sudden you're part of the system. We got to fight you to get what we need or to be our voice or say what needs to be said or done in the community or we don't see you anymore in the community, right? Uh, you know, we look at a lot of things that happened in the past, for example, like urban renewal, you know, where a lot of times, you know, we signed off on it, right, but we didn't, it really didn't benefit the uh, black community uh, to a degree. But it's a, it was a program that, you know, uh, we, um, that we supported. I mean, you know, we talk about the uh, aspect of regentrification, you know, here and around the country. On one hand, it looks like, oh, sounds good, but you find out, you know, you end up with a lot of black folks displaced. And like a lot of times, right, you know, you see that the so-called black elected leadership signs off on this, but they end up being detrimental to uh, the black community in the long run. I do think that, I do think that there are some black leaders who could have been co-opted consciously or unconsciously because I do think that as humans there are moments of weakness or moments when somebody consciously decides that okay, I really not care about this community, um, whether it's black or white, I don't care about them and I'm going to do this just for the short term gain I'm going to get and I don't care what effects it will have down the line to millions of black people. But at the same time I do I do think there are some black leaders who maybe did not who do not have a good sense of who they are or what they should be doing so then they end up unconsciously being seduced and not doing what they're supposed to be doing for the black community. Well, I think it's it's been very much co-opted as you would say. I think that in any war, any battle, you have to have allies. I think that's why the rich class of people have been able to remain rich because they have allies that don't even know their allies. I think it's essential for them to bring on these allies to stay rich. So yes, I don't think I don't think that the co-ops realize that as you would say they're receiving hush money. But they are. And it basically goes back to what I was saying about public assistance. That's what it is. You know, if, if they give us enough to eat and survive, that will keep us out of the loop. You know, we won't, we won't be involved in, in different industries and, and different economical bases that will keep us out of the way. So you have a group of people that have been pacified to stay out of the way. And then you have a group of people who, who are part of these different industries, but they're just satisfied with that. And they take care of home, and, and that's good enough for them. 
So it's no longer about civil rights because in our minds we believe that we have these so-called rights, but there's so many of us that are still being denied. Even during the segregation, we had those people there. But nowadays, we don't have those people. They think they have arrived. I don't have time. I got mine, you get yours. So they're, they're not there. They can only tell how they got to where they are, but they can't tell about no struggles. They, their heart don't bleed for someone else. So there's no one out there. It's still the little man trying to help. It's the little man still trying to pick somebody up and, and help. We've we got a lot of people could do more than they're doing for our black race, but they don't. They don't reach out. They don't tell others what they could be doing. All they want to do is go somewhere and have a barbecue, do face painting, have some music, just to say, that we had a gathering. It's not about that. You never have a seminar on finance telling the young people how to, what to do with their money. Not to be out here uh, renting wheels to go, <laughs> go on their cars. They need to know things that's going to help them in life. Yeah, I, you know, the way I feel about that level of professionalism is that I think we're too passive. I think, you know, we, can, we oftentimes find ourselves in a uh, line of work or, and we have achieved a level of success that might, um, how can I say, it isolates us. We, we become isolated from the community from which we really emerged, if you will. And I think what we often see is a lack of that community engagement from those type leaders who have the respect, they have the, the open gateway to the majority community that could really make things happen. And I think um, it's easy to settle into our little place, if you will. We have our job, we have our Mercedes, we have our you know, sidewalk community, and we go home and we live a great life. But at the same time, we have people dying around us in our neighborhoods, um, and we don't have a voice because yeah. we, don't, we don't have voice. And the, um, I'm gonna say we have to have the influence we have to have the influence to be able to move the needle. And people in those, dentists, lawyers, and those folks are not, I mean, we, we don't have, um, we have limited folks like that who look like us, you know, in all of, in most of these communities. So when we have that kind of leadership, we really need that leadership sitting on foundation boards, chamber of commerce, uh, making, holding the schools accountable, mm -hmm. uh, in the churches, and not being passive. How is black leadership different today than during the civil rights era? Because leadership today, you've got to be able to build consensus across the board. But it's changing at the same time. And I, I still think there's a need for, for both. Uh, there's still a need for what an Al Sharpton might bring to the table. but you've also got to have the Deval Patricks of the world. I think the leadership is changing in, in terms of, of the approaches uh, to, to how we lead and what leadership looks like uh, at this point. To say that, who, you know, I often hear, who's the, who's the leader in the black community? Well, why do we have to have one? I think we're all, we are all capable of leading our lives and being champions for what we care about. So when we have many voices, engaged, uh, advocating, then we can really begin to have some momentum towards change. Because mm -hmm. one person can't take on um, the issues that, that are so critical to all of us and expect to have, you know, any real level of success. Yeah. Dr. King, <laughs> he, you know, he's the, he's the epitome of the one person that really could catalyze and get people to do these kinds of things. But in Spartanburg, I can't tell you that I could point to one person that has that kind of capacity. Right. I am not convinced that we have a single person that has a mantle that has fallen upon them. Um, I think we have an entire community, an entire nation 
of persons who are working without uh, cameras, who are working without national spotlights upon them, mm -hmm. but are doing tremendous grassroots efforts all throughout this nation. When I talk to some of my colleagues, whether they're in uh, Atlanta or Virginia or Florida, I hear of the, the works that they're doing in their communities. Um, so from a national level, uh, I see advancements in, um, in, in jobs, in, in entrepreneurial um, avenues, uh, but on a national level, we still have much work to do. Our families are still falling apart. Divorce rates are still um, out the roof for our families. Issues of fatherlessness, HIV and AIDS, those things from a national level still continue to need to be addressed. For the most part, if there's an injustice, you may get a couple of voices speaking up, but I would like to see folks be, pro be proactive, not reactive, and start working on preventing things before they even happen. Uh, but that means taking time out of your schedule and wanting to meet and talk and discuss the hard issues and not Okay, well that didn't that doesn't affect me and my family, so you know what? All of that said, we talk about it in church, maybe on Sunday, or we go in our, the barbershops to the beauty salons and talk about it, but then it's done. You know, it can't just be talking the talk, you gotta walk the walk. Of course, but sometimes people are constrained, you know. They do a, they do a lot, but sometimes I feel like they do a little more if they were willing to uh, kind of buck the standard a little bit. And I think when you arrive at a, a sound financial future that we need to look back, I think it's our responsibility to do that. Other people may say, well, I'm not responsible that you're not at this certain level. Well, he says that we are our brother's keepers. So yes, you are. It is our job to reach back, whether we spend that money with providing scholarships for African-American children, whether we are putting food so the person can receive nutrition. Um, and I think when you come to the arena where you are just known because of, you know, notoriety because you are an actress or an actor, I think that you too then have a voice. You have an arena that you can share what the needs are and help. You're, you're given that position or you've earned that position. Part of what comes along with that is having a voice being able to open your mouth and say, this is not right. You know, um, a lot of times people are going to listen to the little guy, even though the little guy is saying the exact same thing, but you've been put in a position to have a voice. You can speak for a group of people, why wouldn't you? I think our role is to be an advocate because we're on the ground with, our, it could be our family members, it could be our neighbors friends, what have you, in our African American communities and we have to be the advocate. If we know more, if we know better, then we are to be that advocate for that for, for our people. Mainly because no one else will. No one else will, you know, if we just sit here and act like everything is okay, we will just basically fall by the wayside. So someone has to stand up and say, hi, we exist. This is what we need. This is what we want. You know, usually, especially in Spartanburg, you group people together. You know, you have your educated white people and you have your people that are not so educated. And then we're just grouped together, just black people. So mm -hmm. we really have to stand up for black people. And as an educated black person, that, that's just your job. You have an obligation to take care of the rest of the people in your community. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think a huge part of that role is to talk to the black community and, and become a part of it in a way that you understand the needs there, you understand what they understand their needs to be, rather than trying to label needs. I think we do a great job of, of labeling with statistics um, and a lot of things that, that, a lot of numbers that don't often come up from anything that makes a whole lot of sense. But using statistics and things like that, we make a judgment mm -hmm. without really knowing um, what the actual need is. So once you get in there, you can better assess. And I think that that's the role, getting out there, getting in there, figuring out what's going on, how do we change it.
and that's where the revolution part comes in. What does the millennial generation look for in black leadership? It's gonna take, you know, maybe some activists coming out here to actually sit down in front of a group of kids or sit down with a kid one-on-one -on -one and, you know, teach them what's right because the kids are our future. And the way that, you know, the black community is now kind of sort of, you know, it's already preparing a bad future for these kids because the kids look at what they see now and then later on in life they, you know, put that into their own life if they choose to. So, you know, we want more positive people out here giving the children wisdom and insight instead of all the nonsense that we see these days. I do think they do have the responsibility to make sure that they're not only living for themselves but for the community as a whole because there are already a lot of people who have fought to make sure that um, black people in America and also people from other races who come to America enjoy all the rights and benefits that they do. So we shouldn't just sit back and relax and think that we don't have to improve what is happening um, because the privileges that we're enjoying right now does not give us a right to be blind to the current injustices occurring right now. So I do think we should keep our eyes and ears open and in every generation make sure that there is an issue that we are solving. And if we're not solving it directly, then we should be laying that foundation um, with the younger generation so that in the future that um, issue will not be there or a problem. Well, you better listen, my sisters and brothers, because if you do, you can hear there are voices still calling across the years. And they're all crying across the ocean, and they're crying across the land, and they will to we all come to understand. None of us are free. have the vision to clothe and shield itself with the armor of nationhood? Do we have what it takes to provide the bold black leadership needed to improve our condition as a nation of people? Are we ready to have the hard conversations within our community about our differing viewpoints and values and still work together to unify and raise up the black American nation within the American nation? Or are we just going to stand still and hope that those who oppress and exploit us will write and enforce legislation to protect our needs and interests? Will this corporate government show mercy, invest in educational opportunities and job creation to benefit black America because it is the right thing to do? None of us are free, one of us are chained. None of us are free. So, 
we must decide what we will do to create conditions that provide a future for our people. Our future depends on whether or not we can unify and build a nation of people across invisible geographic and political boundaries. As a people, we need to search and develop within our own local communities for the leadership needed to address our needs, our interests, and our values. Maybe we need to recognize who our leaders are and work with them to put the interests and needs of our community on the forefront of their agendas. Maybe we need to prepare to do battle for our own human resource talent and other resources to determine our own destiny in our own communities in this country. Do you think majority Americans are going to do this for you? For us? Will you join us in building our own nation? Will you be the change you want to see in this world? In this life that I see, stirred up power struggle, fighting for your right. There's always someone that wants to model your words and your dreams are more precious than gold. Wake up.